So the way they captured this was with infrared cameras. This was used to emulate the look of the black sun. So basically what they're doing is they're capturing a color wavelength that human beings can't see. What they did beautifully was they illustrated that the light of the sun is creating this absence of color. And so we've got two shots of characters walking from an interior out into the balconies of the of the arena. And as they, they started in the interior and they had normal lighting, and you can see the color of their flesh and, and all the colors of the outfits. And then as they stepped outside into the, the black sun's light, it took away all color. And then we just got this black and white image. Dune Part 2 is miraculous filmmaking from Denis Villeneuve and expands on everything he brought us in Part 1. Let's break down the science fiction masterpiece of Dune Part 2. What is up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. We just got out of advanced screenings of Dune Part 2. It lived up to all of our expectations as fans of the novel and fans of the original film. Denis Villeneuve somehow, just like he did with Blade Runner 2049, made a sequel that was just as good, if not better, than the original film. He expanded on everything he, he did in the first film. The cast is exciting. We got to see more of the world building. But all, overall, it was one of the most visually striking films I've seen in a long time. I'd put it up there with Oppenheimer in terms of the visuals. It's not a very long time, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> the production. It's been eight months. It's been eight months. It is a very long time. Not really. <laughs> the, the cinematography, the production design, the costuming, and the cast really brought it. The returning cast members as well as the newcomers who really surged a great amount of new energy and life into the storyline. I love what Denis Villeneuve did with the film. We're going to break down everything about the film in this episode we're not going to spoil the movie for anyone who hasn't seen the film for the first 20 or so minutes of this episode but then we're going to get down into the nitty-gritty of what Villeneuve did we're going to compare it to the books we're going to say our favorite things but overall we're going to give you our honest opinions about the film I rated Dune Part 2 a 5 out of 5 on Letterboxd it's really incredible I love the first film but this one just seems like a different class of filmmaking it just seems like he just upped the ante even more his production team just did astounding work on Dune Part 2. And there are actually noticeable differences from Dune 1 that we'll talk about for sure, as well as we're going to break down some major deviations from the book, from the novels, from the original films, from David Lynch's version, obviously. But the writers of this film made massive changes to main characters, significant plot points of this film, which were really interesting. I have some strong opinions about it, but I think that... Overall, I think they were smart decisions because it makes the film a little more relevant for audiences today in terms of character decisions versus, you know, this is an old book from the 1950s and the original films are from the 80s. So I think that some people might find the changes a little jarring, but as a lover of the books and a lover of Denis Villeneuve and a lover of cinema, I thought they were fine because it really tells the story cinematically a lot better. But I just love this film so much and the cast was absurdly good. I mean, we had newcomers like Austin Butler who stole every scene he was in as Fade Routha. Timothy Chalamet basically plays two characters in this movie, pre-Quizox Hotterock and post-Quizox Hotterock as Paul Atreides. Paul Muadiba Atreides. Uh, Zendaya has a huge role as Chani in this film. Rebecca Ferguson is terrific as always. But overall, this movie is just on a different level than 98% of what we get in cinema. Maybe 99%. Maybe 99%. Maybe it's just, bump it up. It's just an incredible filmmaking. It's just so good. And as you were saying how it, it felt different, it, it looked better. And this is because Denis Villeneuve, like we mentioned in our Everything We Know episode, he and Greg Frazier shot this entirely on IMAX format, both digital and film. And I'm telling you, seeing this on an IMAX screen and having it fill the entire image and just enveloping your peripheral view, I was so immersed in this film. It's one of my favorite film-going experiences of the last several years, seeing it in IMAX the way it was meant to be seen. If you can, I know that IMAX theaters aren't everywhere, but if you can get to an IMAX theater... We highly recommend you checking it out in that format because it's the ultimate experience. Then also to hear that booming soundtrack that Hans Zimmer came up with. Again, another earth-shattering score from the legendary composer. But shooting it in IMAX, it added so much depth 
Uh, and they also, for anything digitally, they projected it onto actual 70 millimeter film. So it added that gray naturally when they put it in out for projection and post production. That was because of the delays. So they ad- yeah. had the time to switch from digital, the digital IMAX format, and put it on 70 mil. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Because they were delayed for like five months because it was supposed to come out, we all know, in November. So they had the opportunity to be yeah. able to do that. Well, I'm so glad they did because. It added that grain to it, and the thing with film grain is it, it's it got this texture to it, it's got this look to it that even the most sophisticated of digital filters and post-production filters can't really capture, and when you have it actually put on a film strip, there's something magical about that, and so to see the huge scope of this, which he captured in the first film, but seeing it in the IMAX format, especially with IMAX film, I think it was insurmountably better looking. And I, I remember saying that when I saw that clip a month ago, it was better looking. And it, I saw the Harvester clip, the Harvester attack clip. Oh, no way. They with, showed an action scene. That's pretty so sick. They, the second one, when Brolin shows up. Okay. That's what I saw. Okay. And just that, it's a pretty insignificant scene, really. It's not much going on. But even Besides just... Besides the massive explosion. Yeah, of massive a, explosion. A big machinery. Oh, yeah, there's and, a lot going on. Magnets. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's pretty what are you big. What talking about, man? It's pretty big. <laughs> there's some epic shots. Just that scene was, in my way, in my opinion, uh, visually just as impressive the, as the entirety of Dune Part 1, but even expanded on it. And then when you, I saw, finally, the entire scope of the Dune Part 2 film in the IMAX format, there's imagery in this film that... When the asp- when you can see the full ratio as Denis and Fraser shot it, it will absolutely floor you and blow your mind. So please try to see this in IMAX if you can. We saw it both versions. The first time we saw it was widescreen at a theater. We got a very early invite on February 21st to see it, which was so cool to get an early invite. However, it was in IMAX. Still very grateful to see it. But then we had we hosted a screening at IMAX headquarters. We gave tickets to 30 fans. We did a giveaway if, in case you missed it a couple weeks ago. And seeing it in IMAX was just insurmountably better because, you know, they crop the image for the widescreen. And because, especially on close-ups, they get in there. And we're tight on Timothy Chalamet's face. And I noticed on the widescreen format, it's a beautiful shot still, but his eyes are like kind of half out of frame at some points at the top of the frame, half in, which is fine. I get it. And I love it. It still looks incredible. But when you see it on IMAX format, you have the whole face, the whole head is in shot. Because they framed it for that box. Exactly. So a, a lot does, a, a, more than half the image basically gets cut out for the widescreen Roughly, yeah. uh, projection in average cinemas. So that's why the IMAX experience is so in, so important for a film like this to really see the full vision of Denis Villeneuve and his team. And there's, I, I, we won't get into spoilers just yet, but I just got to say, I mean, I was just blown away with the story. It was deeply intimate while contrasting this huge scope of it. And I was really surprised and pleasantly with how Denis Villeneuve and his writers structured the story. We'll get into a little bit more specifics after the spoiler break. But I was pleasantly surprised with their approach to the story, uh, having read the book and really liking that. I I think that what they did overall was the best way to show and tell the story to contemporary audiences. And I can't think of a better way. Lynch did a very good job considering, but what Villeneuve pulled off with his writing team really worked. And if they were too loyal to the book, it I think it would have thrown audiences off a little bit. I agree. And... The thing was with adaptations, you want a perfect page for page adaptation, but you have to understand the vision of filmmakers and writers are different than that. And adaptations aren't always a perfect, you know, adaptation of a book you love. And I still love it because, you know, Dune Part One, I adore that film. And so it's so patient. And also because they're they're sharing so much information with you about the lore, about jargon you need to know, space jargon, terminology you never heard of in your life. And the second film, they did a better job, I think, of not trying, not confusing the audiences too much because there's a lot they could have put in there that they cut from the film in general, from the books that are relevant to the plot. But they cut characters, they cut points and a lot of jargon, I think, to help people understand the story better, the universe better in the, in the setting of where we are 10,000 years into the future in this intergalactic human race all over the universe. So I think they did a great job of giving a little less lore information that would confuse audiences. But I understand the first film, you have to set it up. And a lot of people, they got confused by some of the jargon, some of the terminology. 
as well as the main complaint was it felt like a trailer for Dune Part 2. That's what everyone was saying. That was the joke online. It was too slow for some people. It was boring for some people, which I didn't find at all because I think it's just sensational. However, the second film, Dune Part 2, is very much a war film as well as being very contemplative. It reminds me very much of Apocalypse Now, especially because we just did an episode on Apocalypse Now, <laughs> where Apocalypse Now has great sequences of battles and war and action but also a lot of moments of contemplation, of meditation, of self-discovery. And this felt like that very much. And, and interestingly, Spice Melange takes a back seat in this movie in a lot of ways. It's there, obviously. But the war is the main focus in the storytelling and the story of Paul Atreides surviving the massacre of his family, trying to get vengeance on the Harkonnens as the Harkonnens are back in control of Arrakis. Beast Raban has been put as control and governor of Arrakis by his uncle Baron Harkonnen. And the emperor is obviously involved because he was pulling the strings with the Sardaukar army to get the Atreides taken out of the equation from the great houses. And obviously we have new terminology coming in, especially with Lady Jessica and Paul being part and accepted into the Fremen culture and part of their community as they enter the sieges and enter their world. And obviously... We'll see, and you've seen the film. We could probably start spoiling now. We're about yeah. 15 minutes yeah, in. Yeah, start spoiling. Where Lady Jessica becomes a reverend mother, which is a major plot point for this film because now the first film didn't touch too much on the prophecies of the Fremen, just subtle things here and there. The Lisa and Al Gaib, the potential Mahdi, the prophet that they've been waiting generations for. Whereas this film very much goes into the religious beliefs of the Fremen as well as how the Bene Gesserit have been laying the foundation for these religious beliefs for thousands of years all over planets across the entire universe, awaiting the arrival of a potential Kwesak's Hadarak to fulfill these prophecies that they've planted there. And Chani is a character whose role in the film is much different than the books because she is totally against these prophecies and she sees the Bene Gesserit and what they've done to her people. Yeah, there's this major theme in the film, which is uh, Messiah or an imposter in terms of Paul Malmdi Atreides. And whether he is the Lisan Al Gaib or whether he is just the someone who came to control. And the idea of control is a major theme in the film as well. So the Messiah uh, in, the, in the entire story and in, in the religion being used as a way to control the people. And that is very much the case in in both ways, where the Bene Gesserit have been laying the groundwork for cent- for generations, preparing the people for the arrival of this being that they've been cultivating through several bloodlines to try and find uh, quasi Kwisatz Haderach. Kwisatz Haderach. <laughs> Close enough. Kwisatz Haderach. The Kwisatz. The Kwis- Quiznos guy. <laughs> oh my God, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, uh, as you said, we're gonna get to. We'll do, we'll do a whole chapter of this episode of the major differences in the books, but I actually did find it refreshing to have uh, someone in the Fremen and having it be Paul's partner, Chani, being an opposing force of she doesn't like his motivations. She doesn't like the path he's going down. She doesn't want the Fremen to be controlled. She wants the Fremen to be free and to live amongst themselves without the rule of anyone. They've been... First, it was the the emperor. Then it was the Hark. Then it was the Harkonnens. Then the Atreides showed up, and back to the Harkonnens. And so, uh, she very much believes that the the Fremen should be free to rule themselves as equals. And the idea of someone else, yet another institution, yet another group of outsiders from a different planet coming to control them in any way, I, I really liked that Shani was opposing that idea, and it added a lot of conflict and friction between her and Paul. Because the film did a great job of showing Paul's uh, in devotion to her. He's he's always very smitten with her, and he's he's really in love with her in the novel. And they showed that really well. They had to do it pretty quickly, but there are a bunch of sequences in the first act of this film when Paul is trying to prove himself to the Fremen. He's trying to learn about the desert and trying to be welcomed as one of the Fremen and trying to prove that he's a friend, not a foe. And... As that's happening, Chani is assisting him. They're bonding. They're falling in love. And they did a great job of doing time jumps further into the relationship where first they're flirting, then she's teaching him about the desert, and then the next time we see them, they're sleeping in a tent. He's having a nightmare. Very smart dialogue of, you don't have to do eight months later. You don't have to have text of that. You don't have to say, we've been together for eight months. But she says... When he wakes up from a nightmare, it's been a while since you've had one of those nightmares. So that tells the audience 
they've been sleeping in the same tent for a very long time now. And a time jump reveal is Paul having the blue eyes of the Fremen. Oh, yeah. He looks through binoculars, he takes it away, and he's got blue eyes now. So that's a great time jump. However, it's not as long as a time jump in the book, which we'll talk about when we get to our section of differences from Dune Part 2, the movie, versus the book, and as well as religion and belief and manipulation being major themes of this film. Action and war are major themes of this film. Action, action, action. This movie has so much of it. Those of you who are supposedly bored during Dune Part 2, it's impossible to be bored during this movie. My jaw was on the floor within 15 minutes of this movie. Denis Villeneuve, he's always been great at directing action. I mean, not every movie has had it that he's made, obviously. I would say Unsun D has a decent amount of action as well as just visual visuals that are incredible. But I think Sicario was his first big step in an action genre. Lots of great set pieces there, action sequences. I mean, the border scene is incredible. The shootout in the traffic. Yeah. Sensational action sequence. And then obviously Blade Runner 2049 is massive with great action. There's some action in Arrival. Good, good fist fights. Yeah. Doom Part 1's got some decent action sequences in, t- in terms of length and size. But this film has many beats of five, ten minute sequences of all-out war, battles, action, desert warfare, guerrilla warfare, which is excellent. It feels almost like a Vietnam film set in a desert landscape at the same time. That's why I f- it feels like Apocalypse Now at times. And the stunts in this movie are incredible. The wire work, f- draw on the floor sometimes. The first 15 minutes of the movie. So if we get into superlatives real quick, yeah, you want to do that? Because because I would love to talk about my best shot right now. All right, well, my, best shot. My favorite shot of this movie, I think, would be, it was in like the first 15 minutes. Obviously, the movie starts with Aralon giving her You're right. a historical record. Me and Anthony, actually, we didn't make a bet, but we guessed each other how we thought the film would open up. What did you think? How did you think the film would open? I thought it would open with uh, Fade in the arena. And introducing Getty Prime. My guess was it would open with Irulan, Princess Irulan, giving an historical account of something that happened. And damn, I was right. You were right because you know the books. So you're you're such a fan of the books, and you know like if you get to you gotta get that in there. Because Princess yeah. Irulan, Irulan's a huge character, and she opens almost every chapter of the book yeah. with historical text that she's written. It makes sense. The his- yeah. histor- she's a horror historical record taker of Paul Muad'Dib's life. And so I thought that if I was making the movie, I would have started it like that too. So, I mean, I'm basically Denis Villeneuve. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite shot, I think, in this in this movie, I've seen it twice, the shot that made my mouth go on the floor was when after the airline scene with the Emperor, then we're in the desert, Shawnee, Paul, or Stilgar, and the Fremen, and they're underneath a sandbank, and they Paul wakes up from what people think are, is a dream, but he's having visions probably, because later he says, I wasn't dreaming. She's like, yeah, sure, bro. And over the bank, there's a Harkonnen ship that's coming down, and all the Harkonnen warriors are using their suspensor belts and falling down slowly with gravity. And then the sequence has where starts where they go hiding, and then Paul and Jessica hide under a cliff after Stilgar tells them to stay right there. But they hide, and then they, the Harkonnens find out that the Fremen are calling a worm, and so they decide to climb the cliff. So one of the guys says, Harkonnens climb, and they hit their suspensor belts, and they all start floating up in the air, nice and slow, along this cliffside. It's an incredible shot. They held it. They went up that cliffside probably like 100 feet with the camera, it felt like, and then they come on top of the cliffside, and then they're still using their suspensor belts, and they're lateral with the ground at the top of the cliffside, like using their hands to keep traveling along the cliff. It was incredible filmmaking. I was just... Blown away by that shot. Yeah, that opening sequence, because it leads into an action sequence with Paul, which was really great hand-to-hand combat. I loved... Denis Villeneuve avoided the color tone of red in the first film. I'm guessing he was saving it for this film, because we said in our last episode, talking about the marketing, from some looks in the trailer, that red was going to be a a very constant presence in this film. Vibrant orange red, yeah. In this film... It was red and orange, and it really, I think that he was illustrating the the theme of spice and the sun in two ways. So what he didn't do in the first film, it worked so well in this film, is whenever Paul had a vision, we had that, that reddish-orange hue of a gradient. Like the title card. Yeah, yeah the t- just like the title card, washing over, scre- over the screen. Uh, as Paul entered his, his visions, and it was as if it's, this is the spice, basically um, giving him the ability to see something in the future. And I love that. 
He did that transition four times for all of Paul's visions, and it was really beautiful. And he brought that theme of the red or orange hues into the look of this film. That sequence was a amazing example of that because you had the the Harkonnen suits were these the, they were black and they were dark. More, I think they they purposely darkened them in this in this sequel because it contrasted with the red of the desert and the red of that sunset um, dusk sky so beautifully. And it was, that contrasting of the black and the red as the soldier hark on his shoulders were elevating up the cliffside, I was just mouth agape. It was so stunning to behold. So many other filmmakers would just shoot it every other, the same way. But the coloring of the, the sequence really made it something special, I think. It would be interesting to watch a double feature of these two movies back-to-back now Mm -hmm. because visually they are actually very different. That's one of the main significant differences I saw in the film as well is the coloring is just so much more vibrant in good ways. But not that the first one, it lacks that. But I think that it was just really effective of setting itself apart from the first film. What was your favorite shot from the movie? My favorite shot was... It was actually my prediction for the final shot of the film, which I was also wrong about. I predicted this would be the the final shot because I saw it in the trailer. I was like, oh, my God. It just showcases so many uh, elements to Paul's evolution and who he has become. Uh, but after he drinks the water of life and he's traveling to the south, uh, southern Fremen are looking out in the distance and they see Paul. Um, and, he's, and then we get this great shot of Paul silhouetted by the bright desert and he's completely out of focus, and the the earth is in focus on the ground in the foreground with us. And then we get another shot of him walking towards us, and then Shai Halud erupts from the sand behind him and just bulldozes, and there's this huge plume of dirt and sand billowing everywhere, and Shai Halud just rises out of the earth behind Paul. I thought I was just like, that's fucking. Unbelievable! I wouldn't even say he was out of focus. It's just the it seems like a mirage, mirage because from of the, the heat. heat. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Let me say it. It's like a mirage because the heat of the planet is just creating uh, the disillusion like sky in front of him. Like, you know what I mean? It's just oh, yeah. warping the air. Yeah, as, that's a good, as that's a good point. You know. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my best shot. All right, who's the MVP of the film? Denis, man, he's the man. Yeah, Denis Villeneuve is the MVP the for me too. Who do you have for best actor? Austin Butler. Me too. He's so good. Raba. <laughs> if anyone was worried Rabban. about it, Rabban. <laughs> if anyone was worried about his voice, it's great. And it's he, not. It's not Elvis at all. It's not Elvis. He definitely emulated what uh, Skarsgård did. I mean, Skarsgård did as the uh, as Baron and the Harkin is having this like guttural, low pitched raspiness to their to their vocal cords. And he was just really phenomenal. It's like they speak from the bottom of their throat. Yeah, it's like down in there. Down yeah. there, like in the gutter of raging. I should have killed you, Uncle. He was, he was really... I had high hopes for him, and he led up to the hype. Uh, Austin Butler as Fade Rotha was perfect. And, and they were perfect with how and when they used him. Yes. Like you said, you thought it was going to be the opening scene. So I thought not only was it going to be the opening scene, I thought it was going to be... Because Paul spends quite a lot of time with the Fremen. I thought we were going to be getting cross-cutting Paul... Sequence, fade, sequence, Paul, sequence, fade, sequence. And what Denis did, which I think worked better, was he lulled us into the safety of the Fremen and let us and he they let us connect to the Fremen, which is important, and all also let us connect to Paul and Shawnee before we ever saw the um, uh, Fade Rothus. So it was probably forty minutes or so until we saw Fade. And then when we did see him, we saw a lot of his sequences together. First the Gladiator Arena and then his uh, then his interaction with his uncle, and then celebration at Getty Prime, and then his promotion to being governor of Arrakis. That, that all happened pretty quickly in succession with one another. And so I thought that was better to do a chunk of time, especially in the first act, being with the Fremen in the desert for the audience. And we put both movies side by side. They really wait maybe three and a half hours before you see Fade Rautha, mm-hmm. which I think is great storytelling because in the book, you see him way sooner than that. Yeah. He's very early in the book. Not the battle, but in terms of seeing Fade and being with Baron, trying to learn from him and everything like that. And I'll, we'll talk more about the things in the book, how it's different from Fade Rautha. But I think he's, to the lore, to the book, really well done. And Austin Butler was sensational. The design of Fade Rautha and in general, the Harkonnens, was exceptional in this film. And just the look and aesthetic of Getty Prime, they expanded on it even more. 
we got we got some great looks of it in the first film. The second film, you know, this massive coliseum, this this triangle coliseum, as well as the black moon. When they're inside the black moon, they have this insanely pale skin with the black eyes. It just I believe contrasts. it's a black sun. So, yeah, is that what I said? You said black moon. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant black yeah, sun. Black sun. Um, and we were trying to figure out yesterday, like how they shot these sequences. I've always been trying to figure out, anyways, from the trailer because it didn't look like black and white film in terms of the sequence where it looks like black and white, but it's just. Anthony looked it up last night and found how it was done with infrared cameras. Yes. So this really excited me because I thought it was going to be a, a black and white sequence, and it wasn't technically because what they did beautifully was they illustrated that the light of the sun is creating this absence of color. And so we've got two shots of characters walking from an interior out into the balconies of the of the arena and as they, they started in the interior and they had normal lighting and you can see the color of their flesh and, and all the colors of the outfits. And then as they stepped outside into the, the black sun's light, it took away all color. And then we just got this black and white image. So the way they captured this was with infrared cameras. So this was used to emulate the look of the black sun. So basically what they're doing is they're capturing a color wavelength that human beings can't see. And black and white... And red infrared cameras have been around for a while. They were invented in, in the early 1900s, the first infrared technology. And then it's just been expanded upon. So basically what they're doing is capturing a black and white image through the color wavelength that we can't perceive. So most cameras, they have a sensor on them that, ex that uh, block out infrared light. And so it doesn't pick up infrared light. Now, this is because if you capture an infrared image, it's super bright, it's super saturated, and it has a extreme vibrancy and color palette that doesn't make sense to us really. It's just like, it, it just doesn't look like an image that we would see. And so what they did is they filmed these sequences with infrared and then they sucked out, they desaturated it, made it monochrome. And that's why it has like this glowing quality to it. You know what I mean? It has like this kind of blooming effect that is similar to, I'm um, not using the silver um, bath when you make film stocks so that sequences like uh, the film of Half-Blood Prince or Saving Private Ryan, they have that glowing quality to them. They had the same thing with this because that's infrared light. So most black and white film is shot panochromatic, meaning it's sensitive to the spectrum of visual of vi spectrum of visual light that we see. That's why normal black and white footage looks normal. And that's why when you shoot with infrared, it's capturing wavelengths of red that we can't see and that's why it has that glowing pluming quality to it so they captured it infrared then they made it monochrome that's why it has that really striking look but you can look at online infrared black and white photography and cinematography it's been around for a while and it's really stunning and Denis Villeneuve it was just so brilliant for him and his team to put that into this film and it made it it really made this feel like a different world Getty Prime like biology seems a little bit different there because of that sun like their fireworks they had like this they were more like gaseous like a liquid gas in the air when they were shooting off their fireworks so it, they made it feel like the the black sun creates a different kind of biological environment to any other planet that we'd seen it was incredible i've never seen anything quite like it on that scale before We'll talk more about that stuff, but let's get into our favorite moment. What was your favorite moment from the film, Anthony? <laughs> My favorite moment was Paul versus Fade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. I was so fucking hyped, man. It was amazing. I really love the scene because... So, a, a, a difference in the book I'll talk about real quick right now, but we'll go more into it when we get to that section, is Paul is unmatched in the universe with his skills and his combat. And in the book, he handles Fade Rother pretty easily for the climax of the book. But I like how in the movie, Denis and his team made it seem more like a 50-50 shot. Like some, either one of them could win. They're almost equals in a lot of ways. And Paul gets wounded twice. He gets two stab wounds and before he takes out Fade Rautha. And I think that added more stakes to the movie. Because even when I was watching, I'm like, holy crap, he just took a blade yeah, to the stomach. I was like, is, like, oh my God. I was like, is, Tom, is, uh, is, is uh, Paul going to lose this? <laughs> Because what I was like, did I do I remember the ending? <laughs> I like it so much because it represents Paul's visions. Because even in the book, when he's going into that fight, he has visions where he loses the fight. He has visions where he gets stabbed. So it kind of blends everything together in terms of Paul winning the fight, but also Paul potentially losing all the different realities that he can see and all the p potential futures. They're all kind of morphed into one with that. We got the hint of that with the Jamis fight 
in the first film at the end where he could see the moves and that ultra it, slow-mo yeah exactly that allowed him to that's what allows him not just because of his amaz- amazing training but because of his vision and insight and, and foresight that makes him an unstoppable fighter yeah he it's not so much that he can see what someone's about to do with their blade it's more it's more the training yeah but it's more because he still goes into a lot of things blind you know he'll, he'll see major events major timelines mm-hmm. But even in the book, when he gets into that fight against Fade, he doesn't know exactly how it's going to end. So he still walks into those moments yeah. blind. And they had they have to make Fade a better warrior, if not a, a, an equal warrior, if not better. Because, like you said, there wouldn't be stakes if Paul handily defeated him. And so changing the a little bit, having your antagonist be this seemingly unstoppable obstacle is what creates the conflict and the stakes for Paul in that fight, which made it really work. And I think that seriously wounding Paul uh, and knocking him down, even for me, knowing the story, I was like, oh shit, what's going to happen next? So I was, (laughs) as a reader of the book, I was like, I was pleasantly like, on waiting on bated breath, what would happen? It's better for an audience, especially people who've never read the book. Mm-hmm. I think it's better for them cinematically, storytelling wise. My favorite moment was Paul riding a maker, riding Shai Halud. I thought it was just an amazing sequence. I was so curious how they're going to pull this off because it's such an important moment. It's, it's the moment where Paul officially becomes a Fremen. You can't be a Fremen unless you ride a worm. Now, the scene of the Sandworm ride was filmed practically on a production unit separate from the main one. Chalamet estimated the scene took over three months to film, with individual shoots occurring over a span of 20 to 30 minutes. As the actual Sandworm wasn't built, and there was no reference shots, the production team designed a small portion of the worm on set, and the actors had to physically visualize and imitate riding the Sandworm. And it was just, the suspense was built so well. You know, big moment, Paul has to ride a, a worm to become a Fremen. He wants to become a Fremen. He wants to be equal to them all. And Stilgar gives him his words of wisdom. Nothing fancy. Nothing fancy, basically. Nothing fancy. No, seriously, don't make, don't embarrass us. And Don't embarrass me in your training you. <laughs> he calls the biggest worm ever. And I love the thumpers. There's so many thumpers in this movie. The thumpers are the little yeah. thing, the devices that create the rhythm into the ground to call a maker. And he calls the biggest worm. And Stilgar's like, not that big. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the biggest worm anyone had ever seen. And it was incredible because he just he runs across the dune, jumps into the smoke of the giant sandworm. And it's just visually was done so well. Because how do you capture that? And I think they did an incredible job and then catches. And the way the sandworm works is you use those hooks to pry apart parts of the sandworm's skin and the abrasiveness of the sand causes the worm to not want to go into the sand again. That's why so they pull apart parts of the sandworm's skin. That's why it doesn't dive under. Yeah, that's why it doesn't dive back into the sand for safety because if it does, it will ex- experience extreme pain. I feel like they borrowed the design of like nostrils for the interior of the skin flaps, mm-hmm. which showed sort of, one, yeah. showed once the once sand blew into it, it, that's what caused it to feel pain to prevent it from diving under. It yeah. looked like it was like... Like little nostril slits in all of its layers of skin, which yeah. I thought was great. So that's how this how it works. How how you're able to ride a maker, and when he rides, it's incredible. And again, it's a it, it, it a sand moving through the desert. Sand a, a sandworm moving through the desert is like it's swimming in water because of vibration. Yeah. And there, but there's so many many moments in the movie that I just love to see so much. Finally seeing it on film versus the book, like when. She, when Paul gets named by Stilgar Usul, and then he picks Muad'Dib as his name, I was wait- I've been waiting and dying mm-hmm. for that moment. Muad'Dib, Muad'Dib, and <laughs> everyone laughs about it. But oh no, it's a wise he name. Points the way. He points the way. <laughs> so, but I would say that's my favorite moment, and I was just ecstatic, waiting on bated breath. <laughs> I was, I loved the drinking of the holy water, because that was such a major part in the book for both Jessica and and Paul to undertake that. Uh, dangerous proposition of drinking the 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 water from within a, a, a the maker and because it really allows paul to finally transform into the quasi quiznos eater quizox hotterock quizox hotterock quizox hotterock it, it's hard to remember quizox hotterock quizox hotterock uh, so it. i and i loved you just say the one yeah the one to contrast the red of the spice the holy water is this beautiful royal blue. Well, it's called the water of life. Water of life, sorry, yeah. yeah. Water of life. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know why I said holy water. <laughs> All right, what's your best line? 
He who can destroy a thing can control a thing. Yeah, he who can destroy a thing has the power to control it. It's a yeah. main theme uh, about power and about control and uh, the danger that lies ahead with Paul's future. My favorite line, I, I don't know word for word from the movie, but it's basically after Paul has become the Kwisatz Haderach after drinking the water of life, and he goes to the cell to the giant meeting of the Fremen in that siege, mm-hmm. and he takes the podium, basically, and he goes in front of everybody, and he runs that incredible monologue. It's so incredible. It's terrifying. He's he's basically not threatening everybody. He's like, no one can touch me. None of you can beat me. None of you can best me one-on-one hand combat. Like, I am the one. I am the chosen one. And basically, that's him taking control of the Fremen. It was a really powerful moment, really powerful scene. I just loved that sequence. And it was juicy, juicy dialogue. And Timothy Chalamet killed it. It's one of his best uh, monologues I've seen him do. Yeah. It's really fantastic. He showed a lot of strength, and then he also showed a lot of intimidation, uh, which we hadn't really seen him give. Like, he's never really had the opportunity in his characters to showcase that in his acting, and I think he knocked it out of the park. That was a really important moment for his character. All right, what was the best action sequence for you? I loved, it's a smaller one, but I loved the first Harvester attack where it was him and Shawnee, uh, avoiding one of the omnithopters and trying to take it ornithopters. out. Ornithopters. Ornithopters. Trying to take it Don't out. Don't worry, guys. I'm correcting them. <laughs> Ornithopter. <laughs> Ornithopter. And trying to take it out. And I, it was it was really great. Just like there's a story to that action sequence. Yeah. From at a beginning, a middle, and end. It had great stakes. One of the best tracks from the album from Hans Zimmer. I love that track. And I just really enjoyed watching Johnny and Paul working together. And showing both of their strengths. And also, Shawnee shot a guy with a rocket. It was fucking awesome. <laughs> it was really phenomenal, visually stunning, and very exciting. And I know there's a huge battle, and there's Shia Halud all over the place in the third act, but I liked this smaller scale action sequence. I like the smaller ones, too, in, in, immensely. That's why it felt like cool guerrilla warfare. Mm-hmm. And I would say, for me, my favorite action sequence was Fade Routh in the battle arena. Oh, yeah, he felt like gladiator. Good. He felt like a gladiator, and it was done really well. The one thing that was missing, like in the books, is there's poison on the tips of the blade. But what they did was one of the trades warriors was not drugged, so he actually had to fight someone. And he took his shield off, and he went hand to hand. He went man to man, no shields. If he dies, he dies. If he wins, he's a hero. And it was it was a great explanation and revelation of a main theme throughout the the books and the story, plans within plans, where. This is something that happens and always fight out the wins because he's facing people who are drugged out of their minds. Like the first two guys he kills easily. It's normal for him with the shield on. It's a show and everyone loves Fade Routh on Getty Prime. But the really the stakes aren't quite there. But then his uncle, the Baron, what's he do? He has one of the people, it's an Atreides, one of the one of the one of the uh prisoners, one of the fighters, he's an Atreides. He's not drugged this time. And he's going to fight Fade mano y mano with no drugs. And then what does Fade do? He realizes that his uncle's doing this. And so what's he do? His uncle's plan is to possibly kill him. He might die. And I'll maintain control because Baron Harkin in this film, he's trying to find a successor. Is it going to be Raban or is it going to be Fade? Or is it going to be someone else? And so basically he's testing Fade as well as potentially killing him. What's Fade do? He takes off the shield as another plan within a plan to show his father, his uncle, that I'm not afraid of this. And he ends up killing the Atreides soldier, becomes a hero because of it, even a bigger hero on Getty Prime. So both of them are operating plans within plans at the same time and and just sort of improvising at the same time. So it's both of them were improvised plans, were, were plans within plans, which is commonly said in the Dune books all over the place, especially in the first book. So that was awesome. Yeah, I love the arena. And... I'm I'm correct. I might be wrong, but I don't think I saw uh, a a corner, a sharp corner in any production architecture of Getty Prime at all. It was all rounded corners. I'd have to look again, but it's possible. So in the the whole design and idea of Getty Getty Prime, it remind it just felt like it was ancient Rome meets science fiction on a different planet, because in that world, it's a, it's a militaristic world. It's a, it's a war. It's a war. A world built on war. And so the heroes of Getty Prime are their, their greatest warriors. And everybody in Getty Prime, uh, all the males are basically are warriors. They're bred for war. And they live and die for battle and for for conquering. Well, I wouldn't say all the men. Like, no. Okay, not all yeah, of them. Yeah. Not all of them. Yeah. Most of them. But it's just, it's like, it's very militaristic. And 
it reminded me, it just felt like it was ancient Rome in a lot of ways. And the design, it was just grand architecture. It was cool to see the infrastructure. Um, and just, again, the celebration of a, a warrior, a warrior of a soldier, like they're the celebrities of, of that planet are the soldiers. And it was just unbelievable cinematography. And again, the rounded structures, there were no, I couldn't, I can't picture there were any sharp edges on the interiors and the exteriors. Everything was rounded. And I really loved uh, the huge, I, I don't know what you would call it, it was like this huge great hall when Fade was being uh, announced as governor of Arrakis and it was his ceremony. And, oh, and they're on stage. Yeah, on stage and the Baron gave him that necklace uh, as tribute. And that entire set was just unbelievable. It was like, that's their temple. You know what I mean? That's their church. And it was just unbelievable production design. And the filmmakers purposely used zero sets from the first film at all. Everything was new. Uh, Denis Villeneuve and his production designer, Patrice Vermette, said they want they didn't want it to feel like they were duplicating anything or feeling it redundant at all. And so every location was either built or they even shot at a couple of places. So where uh, the Emperor's, where, where Princess Erlon is and the Emperor, that's actually a real location in Italy that was designed by a famous architect. And so that's one of the rare instances of they found this beautiful location that suits the world of Dune and they filmed it there. I think it's a hotel. And mostly it's interiors. Yeah. You can see some mm -hmm. like out the doors and courtyards and stuff like that, but there's yeah. no massive exterior establishing shot of exactly. where he is. Yeah, because like they were just purposely like they wanted to do something. They, I think they just found that in scouting. They were like, it, it suits what we're going for. Um, but again, I think the not repeating any looks from the production of the first film is a huge strength to this film because it makes it feel even bigger. I completely, completely agree. And the team of Denis Villeneuve, Greg Fraser, and Patrice Vermette, they're just unstoppable. They're incredible. They're not a juggernaut. Not just Getty Prime, but also I was so curious what the Fremen sieges were going to look like. Now, the sieges are they're massive underground cities, basically, and they're spread out all over, uh, all over the planet, especially in the south where people think that all of the land of Dune and Arrakis is uninhabitable and there's nobody there. But we know that there's tens of thousands, tens of thousands of sieges, millions of Fremen, and Stilgar is the leader of Siege Tabar, which is where they go and where he takes them. And I like how this movie picked up basically right after they found them and after he defeats Jamis. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a time jump, but I think this worked better. Yeah, it does. Well, in the book, there's not quite a time jump yet, and we show them going there, and then there's a time jump. Yeah. And we'll talk about that time jump when we get to the movie verse book section of the episode but the movie picks up basically where jessica and paul had just been picked up by uh, by the fremen after defeating jamas and still guard leading them to siege tabber where he is the leader and shows immediately really quickly like we're talking about how there's two different beliefs amongst the fremen the people how trying describes them as the northerners or no the southerners who are deep believers in the Mosiah, is that right? Yes. Yeah, and then the Northerners like the her. fundamentalists. Yeah, the fundamental, yeah. the fu fundamentalists that are in the South, and that's why Paul's afraid to go to the South because his terrible purpose basically is in the South. If he goes there, that'll lead him to the mass genocide that he will create if he becomes emperor. And this jihad, this religious jihad, basically is what they talk about in the book a lot, and we talk about a religious war of the holy war the right? holy war yeah. the religious war the holy war that will be led by paul atreides paul muadib atreides leader of the fremen from arrakis across the universe as he if he ascends the throne as emperor that's the path if he goes to the south and that's why he's afraid to go there chai says he's afraid to go to the south he's afraid of the fundamentalist because that's where it will happen that's where it will continue if he follows that path but still i like how there's a, a stark difference between two types of fremen chani being one who's a non-believer and understands the Bene Gesserit ways how they've manipulated these, their people for thousands of years. Like I said, laying, that's what the Bene Gesserit do. Across the entire universe, they lay foundations of their teachings, of their, of their work, so that when a potential Kwisatz Haarach shows up to a planet like Arrakis, albeit Paul Trades, according to their mythologies, according to their religions, he fits the bill, fits the signs of their Mahdi, their Messiah, their Lisan al-Gaib, as they call it on Arrakis, as the Fremen call it. So that's why 
he kind of knows their ways because he has visions, obviously, but he knows things about the Fremen that no one, no outsider should know. Same thing with Lady Jessica. She knows things about the Fremen according to their religion because she's a Bane Jesuit. She knows the ways. She knows the signs. She talks about when, when they say that she has to become Reverend Mother or die, Paul says you should be honored. She's like, it was either this or death, so I'm not that honored. But also, he asks her, how does that happen? She says it's different on every planet. Every culture is different for how you become Reverend Mother. But this is an important sequence for the film because in order to become Reverend Mother, and a Reverend Mother is, uh, it's a Bane Jesuit initiate who converts an awareness spectrum nar- narcotic within their body to unlock their, their genetic memory and basically have all of the Bene Jesuit mothers who have been Reverend Mothers in their consciousness, generational consciousness, you've lived their lives, you can see everything they've done in their entire lives. They live inside of you, basically. Lady Jessica becomes Reverend Mother by drinking the water of life. Now, the narcotic on Arrakis is the bile of a young sandworm, the water of life, which is created, as we see in the movie, by drowning a baby worm, a baby sandworm, a baby maker in water, and then extracting this bile, this excretion, right as the sandworm dies from their body, and then that is the water of life. And that's what that's what Jessica does in this film. That's what every Reverend Mother on Arrakis does. They drink the water of life, which would kill any normal person, would kill any man especially. However, because she's trained in Bene Gesserit ways, she can take a lethal substance like a poison and alter it inside of her body in order to accept it and it'll change her. And that's what creates her, changes her genetics to unlock that genetic memory. And in that's the, basically what happens. In the f- many Fremen, the believers, the fundamentalists, when they see her survive, they think it's divine. Exactly. It's prophesied yeah. because it's part of their religion, because yeah. it's something that the Bene Gesserit have brought there generations before, thousands of years before. Paul and Jessica got there. There's a great shot right before you get into it that perfectly works as a metaphor for the Fremen religion. And it's early on in Siege to Bear when when um Stilgar is speaking with the other elders of his tribe and they're in, sitting in a circle. But the reveal of that, when we get the first shot of that room is we're framed, we're framing the group of elders speaking in the background and they are surround and on both the right and left side of the frame are scriptured walls with the the writings of their religion and and that's basically showcasing that the fremen are trapped in this prison of this false religion and it was just it's a simple shot but it perfectly showcases with an image what's happened to these people and how they're being controlled and how they have these these myths and these ideas and the spiritual religion has been controlling them for the ages. It's interesting because specifically with the Fremen, you could say it's not a false religion because Paul ends up becoming the Kwisak Haderach. Yeah. But is he the Lisan Al Gaib? You have to have read the books to understand if he is the Lisan Al Gaib or not, or who the Lisan Al Gaib really is in the Dune lore. Which I'll, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Um, a lot of you Dunies, I'm sure you know. <laughs> Dunies. But, you know, it, it it is interesting because many things do come true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Paul is the least on al Gaib, but he definitely is the Kwisatz Haderach in this film and in the story. Yes, the 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 generations of Bene Gesserit yeah. influence and breeding created. Created he, Paul. Be, he became it. And it happened because he went to Arrakis. He was exposed to the spice at such massive levels, and he drank the water of life. That's how yes. he became the least on al Gaib. I mean, the Kwisatz Haderach, but the least on al Gaib is... Basically, the Kwisatz Tarak in a way, but it's the Fremen's belief of their Messiah. So mm-hmm. they're the same thing, but different. Different paths and trajectories that Paul could take. Now, one of my favorite parts of Dune Part 2 of, specifically with Lady Jessica and the War of Life, and I was so curious how they're going to do this, is Lady Jessica's pregnant. She has a daughter inside of her. And when she drinks the Water of Life, not only does she get her genetic mutation happened and she gets the the lives and the memories and the the consciousness of all the reverend mothers of the past but the child inside of her becomes aware and this is her daughter this is alia and me and anthony were trying to figure out who this casting would play and 
we knew Anya Taylor Joy was in the movie because the red carpet. Anya Taylor Joy is there. And we're like, she's in the movie. What? <laughs> so we were like, is she gonna be a Ben Jesuit? Is she gonna be this? And then we both realized and theorized, and we talked about this in the Everything We Know About Dune episode. She's probably gonna be Alia. We didn't know if they do a de-aging because in the book, Alia is also represented as a two-year-old child after a time jump. And we were like, do they de-age her? But then they did a really great thing where they just showed Alia on a beach, on a desert beach, and in an adult version of her represented through Paul as he drinks the water of life himself. And he sees his sister as an adult, as Anya Taylor-Joy. I thought it was really brilliant because it's a tough thing to do. If you have a two-year-old that has to talk like a like an adult or has to talk like a reverend mother with yeah. centuries of experience, it's tough to pull off. And you could only do it with CGI, really, to do it justice to the and book. It still wouldn't look right. Yeah, so it was really interesting. I thought the womb cinematography was stellar, mm -hmm. sensational, beautiful. Especially during the transformation after taking the the water of life and the blues and the blue chemicals seep into the womb yeah. and en encapsulate, encapsulate her and, and then the blending of... We got multiple sequences of faces blending into each other. In this case, it was the faces of previous reverend mothers uh, using shadows and light play with dissolves, and they're all, all making their, they're all becoming one inside of Jessica's mind and inside of Alia's mind. And then also, uh, when Paul drinks the water of life, we see the transition of faces of babies, countless babies being bred, and in the line of both. Uh, of their line, and that's of the what, of the of the men of yes. the Atreides line, yeah. and then that's how he learns that he's actually the grandson of Baron Harkonnen, which we'll, we can get into. I, I can get into real quick, which is a great reveal. Yeah. So it's we we don't get much in the in this movie, but we do learn through this case that once Paul gains that power and that vision, he sees that Jessica is actually the daughter of Baron Harkonnen, and she didn't even know that. She wasn't sure about that. Not until she drank Not water. Not until she drank it. And so the real the quick backstory of Paul being the Baron's grandson. So Paul is um, part Harkonnen. So the young Baron Vladimir Harkonnen was described as an exceedingly handsome man, possessing red hair and near perfect physique. This is in the book. The Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Moha Mohim inst was instructed by the Sisterhood of the Bene Gesserit to collect genetic material through contraception through conception from Baron Harkonnen for their breeding program. And as the Barons, however, the Baron was a homosexual, which is well known. It was an open secret. So Mohiam blackmailed him into having sexual relations with her to conceive a child. That daughter proved genetically undesirable, so they killed, the Bene Gesserit killed her. And then the Baron and her conceived a second child who was Jessica. Yeah. Pretty wild. Pretty wild. If we were in a theater, and I don't think many people had read the book because they're like, what? They're Harkonnens. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also, I mean, real quick, the reason why Baron Harkonnen is so large was that after the first failed attempt, he he raped and killed, uh, who was it? Moyim. And as retribution, she cast... Well, she didn't kill him. She, she didn't kill her. She, he didn't kill her. He raped her. And then to get retribution, she cast... Uh, this ailment on him of being exceedingly obese. What the, the Baron always lied to everybody, saying that he was really big because he liked to overindulge in food. So he always lied about this ailment he's had since that spell was basically that spell was cast on him. Yeah, it's it's really crazy. It's an awesome revelation. In case anyone never read the book, that Paul is actually a Harkonnen, and I love that line where he's like, "In order to win, we have to we we're, we have to be Harkonnens." Mm -hmm. And back to Alia in the womb. She speaks to Jessica, and it's done so well where we don't really hear Alia's voice. Really only once we hear it come out of Jessica's mouth. It's it's just a harsh sort of the voice speaking. The the, the, the I heard Anya say a line earlier. Yeah. I but we, we her, can yeah. there's a few scenes where Jessica's obviously talking to her woman, like your sister says this, and there's a line that comes out of her mouth when she's speaking to Paul, mm -hmm. I believe, before she goes south, where it's actually Alia's voice speaking mm -hmm. through Jessica. But a few times uh, a reverend mother speaks through Jessica's mouth like, we, we are something, like we're waiting for you, we want you, or or some, I can't remember what it is, but it's really interesting to hear other voices speak out of Jessica, mm -hmm. because in the books, it's really through their minds, you're hearing it, you're inside Jessica's mind, obviously, and you can hear the voice, but I think it was done really well in terms of, we're not going to have Alia be born yet, she'll be in the womb, 
But it's just really, I was so intrigued of how Denis was going to capture it. And I think it was done so well. And visually was stunning and showing the progression of Alia's growth inside the womb. And then obviously speaking to her mother was, it was sometimes very funny. She's like, be quiet, <laughs> shut up. Uh, Denis, I think he also wanted to do his own space baby. Yeah. <laughs> 2001 Definitely. space baby. Uh, and also it freed them up to focus more on Paul and Fade and Shani. Because that's a whole other storyline. Because Alia is big in the books. She's kidnapped by the Baron's people and she's brought to Getty Prime. And all no, she's brought to um, um the, the, the ending, the, of it, yeah, the, the ending Emperor's ship. ship, yeah, the ship. Um, so she's there, and she's in the book. She's the one who kills the emperor. No, she, she kills Baron Harkin. I mean, she's the one who kills Baron Harkin and even and calls him her grandfather. And they change it to Paul. It still works perfectly with Paul doing it. And also, I think I'm not sure people would have re reacted well to a child killing. Yeah, maybe not a person back then. Yeah, but. 40 years later, it's something people would have trouble watching, I think. It would just be hard to do. Because yeah. the thing with the dunes that Denis made, they're so grounded in, in, in terms of reality and mm -hmm. realism. Obviously, it's fantastical. It's a space, space movie, 10,000 years in the future, crazy technology. But also, would it have worked if they had a three-year-old running around with a knife? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> because she in the book, she is she is Fremen. She's born Fremen. She yeah. grows up as a Fremen. And she... Lives amongst him in the siege, and there's a lot of stuff that she's doing. And Isn't she like super happy about killing him too? Oh yeah, she's yeah, stoked. Yeah, she's like, well, she's a she's a trained Fremen child. Yeah. Fremen tra all Fremen are killers. They're yeah. all trained to fight and trained in war and battle. Yeah. And there's scenes where she's just running around killing dead soldiers. Like, oh, almost yeah. Dead, she's almost <laughs> dead soldiers. She goes. She's. I, I. I think it was. She's ruthless. Yeah. Lady Jessica in the book. She asked Paul, "Where's your sister?" And he's like, she's Fremen. She's going off killing all the wounded Harkonnens, basically. She's going off stabbing them to <laughs> yeah. death. It's crazy. Yeah, I forgot about that. Now, let's head into our intermission. But at, when we get back, I want to talk about the different... We're going to do a whole chapter and list off the huge changes from the book into the film. I also want to talk about Hans Zimmer in depth. And there's still so much yeah, more to talk so about much, from so the many story other things the to talk about Because I, I loved what Hans did. And before we continue, the best way to support our show, Raiders of the Lost Podcast, is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. It's a subscription-based form of support. You get perks like personalized videos, access to our Discord, as well as access to the ad-free version of every single episode, which you can link with your Spotify and Patreon and listen to ad-free on Spotify. You can also support us by leaving those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's a great way for us to get found and discovered on the platforms. I'm getting a tattoo at 5,000 Apple ratings. I'll read a review off in a little bit. And another great way to support our show is just to share us. Share this episode. It's a big one for us. We've been waiting for Dune Part 2 for such a long time. We hope it's going to be a banger. And just if you know anyone who loves Dune or just loves movies in general, share our show with them. Share the load. I can't wait to pick out that tattoo for you. <laughs> This episode, of course, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as a ton of Dune and Dune Part 2 posters. So if you want to get yourself some Dune stuff, go to MoviePosters.com. They have all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for some epic poster designs. Be sure to use our promo code at MoviePosters.com right now and get 10% off your order today. We're almost at 2,000 ratings on Apple, I just saw. Yeah. Closing out 1,900. Getting there, getting there. People want me to get that tattoo. <laughs> All right, let's get into our intermission, Anthony. Let's start the movie quote competition. Are you ready? Ready. Have the lambs stop screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Clarice. Have the lambs stopped screaming? Sasa lambs. Yep. I did an easy one, too, just because it was great. If my calculations are correct, when this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not Back to the Future, um, but it's... What is it? Is it Back to the Future? No, it's... it's... What's your guess? Is it Back to the Future? I thought it was. It's a. There's another movie that references Back to the Future with this. Crap! What is it? All right, it's Back to the Future. Yes, yeah, Back yeah. to the Future. Because there's, there's a movie that does that scene, and they say that. Oh yeah. But they, it's a funny line. It's like I, my, I predict that 88 miles per hour. This. Are you that, thinking of Paul Rudd? 
I don't know who I'm thinking. Because Paul Rudd says, "Where we're going, we don't need roads." No, no. What I'm saying is the line that you just said. Huh. There's a movie that does that reference, but then they do a joke line at the end. Oh. They change it up at the end. So I didn't know if it was that because I thought it was a trick question for a second. No, it's a simple, straightforward yeah, question. It. Pretty straightforward. Yeah, pretty straightforward. All right, I think that's this movie release here. Planet of the Apes. 1972. 68. Damn. The year 68. It was an old movie. 068 AD. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, really getting in there. Just want to make sure you knew that I was talking about the year 68 and not 1968. What year did Back to the Future come out? 1985. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You did it. Two for two. Okay. Anthony, movie pop quiz time. How many Coen Brothers movies has Josh Brolin been in? And can you name them? No Country. Uno. True Grit. Dos. Hail Caesar. Tres. Um, that might be it. Let me think. Yeah, I'm going three. That's correct. Yes. Mundo. Yeah. He got it, guys. He got it. How many Oscar nominations did Back to the Future receive? And how many did it win? It won. Did it win any Oscars? Let's see. I'm going to guess it won visual effects. Correct. And I'm guessing it was nominated... For three awards. Three other ones, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> three for three, three for baby. three, man. Woo! High five. Nice. Congrats. Thanks, dude. You win nothing. <laughs> 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 we got someone good on subscribes. Yeah, what do we got? <laughs> so in our best movies of the 1980s episodes, Batman Who Laughs wrote, you guys put a movie about soup ahead of Return of the Jedi unsubscribed. <laughs> Tempopo. Tempopo is really that great. Watch Tempopo. Yeah, Tempopo is amazing. And then you'll be like, all right, I get it. Okay, I, I get, get it. it. I get it. Yeah. Harrison wrote in our Tarantino episode, we need a taxi driver, first Joker, first King of Comedy video unsubscribed. We should do that because yeah, be we fun. did do Taxi jo Driver versus Joker as our seventh episode on the show. Wow. Long back in 2020. Time. Long fucking time ago. But that was when we didn't know what we were doing really. We're right. so much better now. <laughs> or are we? Or maybe we hit our peak there. That's it for our unsubscribe so far. Okay. Because we've been have... recording a lot lately. Let me read out a great five-star written review. Let's hear it. From, let's see, Pizza Time Parker. <laughs> a great discovery. Five stars. Came across these two Bostonians while listening to the Confused Breakfast podcast episode about Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Great show. Love mm -hmm. those guys. And knew I had to check out their show. Man, I was hooked right away. Their content is great, but I got to admit, their intermission is becoming my favorite. The movie quote back and forth is great. Hearing all the latest unsubscribe <laughs> leaves me laughing. And finally, the movie recommendations have been a great addition to my week. Man, Ricochet was a ride. I'm glad I finally gave Source Code a chance. Hell yeah. Nice. Working through the backlog now. Hype to hear you in person at the live show. Keep up the great work. Subscribed. Thanks, pal. Coming to the live show and everything. Heck yeah. Fuck yeah. Love to hear it. I'm glad you like Ricochet. It's a great fucking crazy Denzel, Denzel movie. movie. It's so cool. And I love Source Code. I'm glad you like those too. Thank you, Pizza Time Parker. Yeah, thanks, Pizza Time. Pizza Time. Pizza Time. All right, Anthony, speaking of streaming recommendations, what is yours? For this episode, I mean, I got to recommend Dune on Max. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, watch it. And, to re and if you have seen it, Watch it again to prepare for Doom Part 2. I'm assuming they've seen Dune, Anthony, if they've made it this far into this episode. Some people listen and they haven't seen the movies. <laughs> sure they do. <laughs> All right. My streaming recommendation is a classic horror film that I got vibes from when I watched a specific scene and you were telling me about it, how the inspiration was an exorcism scene with Lady Jessica drinking the water of life. The Exorcist is on Max. Oh, nice. So just watch Great that wreck. because it's amazing. Great wreck. She's so good in that scene. Yeah, it was awesome. What a great physical moment. All right, you want to just take a break from a lot of the movie stuff and just get back into the episode and talk about the major differences from the book, which is obviously related to the movie at the same time. Yeah, let's go through the major book-to-film differences from Dune Part 2 and the novel by Frank Herbert. Now, the biggest difference between Dune Part 2, the movie, and the book is Chani. Her character is much more dynamic and more internally driven with her own actions. In the books, Chani is a very devout follower and lover of Paul, and never doubts him in the movie. She doubts him being the Mahdi, being the Lisan al Gaib. She doubts the beliefs that the Southern Fremens have of this prophet coming. In the movie, 
She also doesn't believe in Paul's foresight or potentially being this otherworldly being. Chani recognizes the Bene Gesserit ways have turned her people into believers for generations of a potential false prophet. The Messiah is their way of enslaving the Fremen with blind belief and worship for when their Kwisatz Tatarak, the Bene Gesserit's person, should arrive on their planet, which it end up, ends up happening with Paul. Another major change with Chani and Paul. Chani is, she gives birth in the books. She has a son with Paul. Leto the second. Leto the second is born and is killed by the Harkonnens. We never see him in the books, but he's in the south. And during the massive attacks, during the war towards the, the towards the end of the book, Paul, with his visions and is told at the same time that his son has been killed. He knows his son has died. He's, I believe, just like one years old. He's a baby, and that is not in the movie at all. Chani is not pregnant in this movie that we know of. Maybe the third film will open up with her being pregnant from Paul. We don't know, but, you know, staying on Chani, she's an opposing force to Paul towards the end of the film. And also a major difference is at the end of the climax of after Paul defeats Fade Rautha and he gets the throne, he tells the emperor, I'll marry, I'm going to marry your daughter, Irulan. That's one of my prices that I want as well as becoming emperor. But he tells Irulan, you will never, I will never touch you and you will not have my children Chani will be my lover and will have will give my heir, give birth to my heir after the death of their first son, obviously. They'll have more. And he says, I envision we'll have more children. But he tells him right up front that I'm not going to touch Erlon. Chani's going to be my girl. Versus in the movie, he says, I will take Erlon as my bride. And then tells, even though before that he tells Chani, I'll love you for as long as I live, but Chani leaves and he never says that I won't touch Irulan. So I'm curious what they're going to do with part three. That might be a, a plot between uh, Florence Pugh and Timothy Chalamet's characters in the third film. It's possible. Yeah. Because going into the third, I don't, I don't want to spoil in case no one's ever seen it, but that was a major deviation from the story for Chani. And building off of Chani and the representation of Fremen, a major difference in the film, Dune Part Two, is the cultural beliefs of the North versus the South. So in the South, in Dune Part 2, they're more fundamentalists and they're firm believers in the prophesized one that is possibly arriving right now with Paul, whereas the Northerners believe that all this religion and this prophecy is all made up to control them by the Bene Gesserit. So there's a big contrast and conflict between the Northerners and the Southerners amongst the Fremen people. And so Chani, the film ends with her leaving Paul and going back into the desert by herself, calling a sandworm, even though it doesn't end with her jumping on the sandworm. The shot, the movie ends just with the shot of her as the thumpers bounce, uh, hitting the, the desert floor, yeah. calling a maker. So I'm so curious because in the book, she's always bought by Paul's side. In the third book opens up obviously by Paul's side. So. I'm curious what's going to happen with Chani. She's also represented really well in terms of being a fighter in a war in a Fadaikin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. However, in the in the movie in the books, she's a Sayad Sayadina, which is basically a high priestess in their religion. That's how she's so well knowledge and well versed in the religious aspects of like saving Paul's life with a drop of the water of life. She's basically a high priestess. Mm -hmm. Great point. Not quite a reverend mother, but she's she's that. But yeah, that's the main difference I think is. Paul, uh, besides not being pregnant and not having a child with Paul in the time jump, there's not really a significant time jump in this movie. She is an opposing force to Paul and doesn't believe in him. Absolutely. All right. Another huge change, which we touched on earlier, is Alia Atreides, Paul's sister, Jessica and Leto's daughter. Now, in the book, as we mentioned earlier in the episode, she's portrayed as a young girl. Jessica does give birth to her, and she grows to the age of two during the course of the second half of the book. She's highly intelligent. She is a reverend mother, just like her mother is. And she becomes vital to the plot of the film and ends up actually killing Baron Harkonnen at the end of the story. However, Denis Villeneuve, I think, wisely changed this story beat and made Alia an unborn infant inside the womb although she's still a reverend mother and communicates with Jessica, this probably worked better for modern audiences, as well as the previous adaptations not really working that well with the representation of Alia. It just seems clunky. It seemed to not fit or feel right. Uh, David Lynch cast like a six-year-old, and they used the voice of an older woman uh, in post-production. It never quite felt working. It felt honky, wonky in a way. And so I think that... Keeping her in the womb and keeping her as an unborn child 
was probably the best th- best case scenario for contemporary audiences watching this and being able to uh, d- digest it and take it seriously. Speaking of Lady Jessica, she is oh. sinister in this movie, and I love it because it really shows how evil and sinister the Bene Gesserit are. In the book, her actions are more about her and Paul's survival of being accepted by the Fremen and obviously using his powers and wanting him to be the Kwisatz Haderach is her life goal, really. That's why she gives birth to a son, also because of out of love for Leto, because Leto wanted a son, even though she was ordered by the Bene Gesserit to produce a daughter because Bene Gesserit can alter the sex of the baby and, and decide the sex in the womb. Now, Lady Jessica is a lot more sinister. After she becomes a reverend mother, she starts to use the the Fremen culture and religion and their beliefs, specifically the weaker people, if they have developed beliefs about the Fremen's Messiah, the Mahdi, the Lisa al-Gaib, and using that to help Paul gain power, even though he doesn't want power, she's pulling strings behind his back to get him the power. So I really like how she's stirring the pot amongst the Fremen, dividing the Fremen to raise Paul up. And there's another huge subplot amongst Jessica's storyline in the book concerning Gurney Halleck. Yep. So Gurney Halleck, in the book, when he joins back up with Paul, he believes that Jessica is the one who betrayed the Duke, Duke Leto, and caused his death. And so Gurney, he has a couple of very intense scenes with Jessica in the novel, threatening scenes. And he really truly believes that she is the was the cause of Leto's death, which causes a great amount of friction and conflict between the two. And in the film, I'm not even sure if they shared a scene together they at don't all. Know. Yeah, they don't. So the thing with that is Gurney, he's a smuggler. He's, he's staying on Arrakis because he wants Harkonnen blood, but he also wants to find, or he's always believed that Jessica betrayed Leto. Yeah. Same thing with Thufir Howard, who's not in this film. Surprisingly, Thufir Howard is not in the movie. I was I was pretty surprised by that, but. Gurney, even when he gets to the siege after him and Paul reunite in the desert, he puts a knife to Jessica's throat and almost kills her in front of Paul. But Paul convinced him to put the knife down because he believes so much and he wants blood. Thufir Howard is someone who also believed that Jessica betrayed Leo. In the book, Thufir is now under the control of Baron Harkonnen because he's a mentat. He needs to keep computing. He needs to keep working. And since the Atreides are wiped out, the only family that he would want, that he could really work for and be a mentat for, are the Harkonnen. So he's working for the Baron Harkonnen. Not, he doesn't want to do it. It's kind of like he has to do it. He does not believe Paul is alive either. And also in the book, Baron Harkonnen is, Harkonnen is slowly poisoning Thufir Howitz, Thufir Howitz and Thufur is all the way there into the end, and he's reunited with Paul in the climax of the book, which is a nice moment where he doesn't get killed by Paul, even though the Baron, I, I can't remember, someone, like, Thufur wants, Baron wants Thufur to kill Paul, I believe. He's trying to get him to do it, but Thufur doesn't do it, and he succumbs to the poison that the Baron's been slowly feeding him. So I was shocked to not see Henderson in this movie as Thufur Howard because he's on the cast list. He's on the Wikipedia page, he's on the IMDb. Yeah. I'm assuming... This, fil- this film, even though it's, it's remarkable, it felt like there was stuff on the cutting room floor. Yeah, there are definitely plenty of deleted scenes and footage. Also, another major aspect to Doom Part 2's differences from the book is after killing Jamis, as is the, the way with Fremen, Paul actually inherits Jamis's family, his children and his wife. In possessions. In, pos- in possessions. And so Paul decides not to accept Jamis's wife, but does accept their children as his own in the book. Yeah, and he also gets Jamis's water. So when the Fremen take the water from their bodies, Paul gets a necklace, like a water necklace of his water. And he, like you say, accepts Jamis's children as his own. And Jamis has two children. One is a biological son because the Fremen culture is if you best somebody, you inherit everything that belongs to them or you, know, you inherit their family as well. They become your responsibility. So the children are Paul's responsibility, just like how the son that wasn't Jamis's actual blood was his son, was his responsibility because he bested his father. And Hara's the wife that has gone from person to person. And it's just part of the Fremen culture. They're all they're all equal. They're all together. So even though it's not his blood, it's still his son. There's another major difference that it's in the Dune part one as well regarding the Harkonnens. In the novel, they are ginger-haired yeah. beings. And Denis Villeneuve's interpretation, they're hairless. And it, I think it works better. Yeah, for the Harkins, yeah. 
Lady Margot, she has a husband in the book called Count Hasimir Fenring. He's a conspirator with the Baron, and he's also a master assassin. He's prevalent throughout the book. He's even there in the final battle between Paul and Fade, and he's a potential assassin that they're trying to get to kill Paul if Fade fails, but he's not in the, in the movie at all. That's a character that you don't need. It's fine that he's not in the movie yeah. at all, but Lady Margot is portrayed very well in the, in the movie compared to the books. Let's see what else we have for major differences. I would say a massive reduction in, in change from the, not change, omission. But some omission from the book to the movies are the Guild Navigators. So I, I feel like the Guild Navi Navi Navigators were referenced in the first movie when Duke Leto is accepting his fief of Arrakis. And it's that scene where he uses his insignia and his, his ring to with, to leave the Mac, the wax mark on the contract accept basically, it. to accept the deal from the Emperor. I'm assuming it's the Guild Navigators that are inside. They have those massive helmets with the orange spice, the melange floating and hovering inside the clouds of smoke. So the Guild Navigators have a major role in the second half of this movie, though. So a Guild Navigator was a senior rank of artificially super-evolved humans within the space and guild, and for many guildsmen, the pinnacle of their ambitions mutated through the consumption of an exposure to massive amounts of the spice melange navigators are able to use a mentally conditioned and trained form of prescience to safely navigate interstellar and galactic space in long range starships called highlanders that's how humans are able to uh colonize the universe is through prescience and foresight from the spice to safely travel intergalactically otherwise, travel, yeah. otherwise they would crash into asteroid belts and planets, planets and everything yeah, like that yeah and so the thing with guild navigators is they're mutated. They're more amphibian. They're they're human to an extent, but they've morphed into almost amphibious beings. And they live in these clouds and vapor of melange. And they have a massive melange diet. That's how they can see prescient visions. And they're integral to the ending of the film in the book because in the book and also in the movie, Paul threatens to blow up the melange, the spice field. And that's his his bargaining chip to gain control of the throne to become emperor of the universe. Now in the movie, it's different where after he makes the emperor kiss his ring, he kind of proclaims himself as emperor, and he threatens with the net to the great houses that I'll blow the spice. After that, Gurney informs Paul that the great houses have not accepted his ascendancy if they have not recognized his ascendancy to the throne which is something that he's going to have to deal with in the third film. Now, in the book, because the guild navigators are there inside the ships, and the guild is there, space and guild is there with the great houses, Paul has Gurney tell them that I will blow up the spice fields and have your guild navigators foresee whether I'll do it or not. And the guild navigators, with their foresight, see that Paul will do it. And then everyone accepts his, accepts his ascendancy to the throne, and in the book, he becomes emperor right there because the guild no navigators know he's not bluffing. He's no BS. He's going to blow everything up because we can see him doing it if we say no. So that's a major difference with the guild navigators not being in the movie, but also how integral they are to Paul's ascendancy. He's not fucking around. Not fucking around. <laughs> also, there's a change with the, the physicality and look of emperor. Shot him. He looks to be about 30 in the book, and he's in great shape because of his constant access to Melange. And also, uh, Baron Harkin, and then obviously Christopher Walken, about 80 years old, played him in the movie, but it still works. It works better for people to accept, you know, Florence Pugh's his daughter. If he looked as young as his daughter, I think audiences would be like, why is that his, her dad? Yeah, unless they explained it, yeah. yeah. And then Baron Harkonnen's death in, in the novel, he is killed by his granddaughter, Alia Atreides. However, in the movie, his grandson, Paul Atreides, kill him, kills him, but the line is still the same, where Paul walks up to him and says, hello, grandfather, and stabs him right in the throat. Exactly. Now, there's some other differences with Fade Rautha that are not in the movie that are in the book. So he's, he's in the book a lot sooner. And what's interesting with him is his relationship with his uncle, Baron Harkonnen. Now, in the books, Fade Rautha tries to kill his uncle with a poisoned boy because the Hark Baron Harkonnen likes to sleep with boys. It's messed up. And I like how they cut that from the movies because we don't need that. It's pretty out it's of touch. It's adults in the movie. It's out of touch yeah. now. You know, it, it doesn't fit with the context of contemporary audiences. But he tries to get him by putting a poison needle on one of these boys that the Baron likes to 
have. And so they're, they're both kind of going back and forth, kind of trying to kill each other in the books, which is really interesting. And it's one of Fade's great ambitions to kill his uncle, to inherit being the, the, the heir of the Harkonnens of the family of the house. And that's a major scene and some major sequences of, of Fade being chosen by Baron. They show it in the movie, but they do it a little differently in the book to be the heir. 100%. I, they, I like the change with he likes to – he likes adults in the book and in the novel, in the movie instead of the book. It works better. And it's, it's better for audiences. Audiences, this book's written so long ago that you do have to make changes to the contemporary culture and – in the contemporary times uh, to make it suitable for people to enjoy. So it's, that's important factoring in these changes. If he had done a strict faithful adaptation, it audiences, I think would have in some ways rejected it. Yeah. And some things on Paul that are different. He drinks the water of life on his own. He's in a coma for weeks. He's in that state for weeks before Jessica actually asks Chani to come and help her. Chani and Jessica in the books, they become, they have a very strong relationship by the end of the book and they love each other. In the movie, it is the exact opposite. They can't stand each other. And it's interesting to have that contrast and have that, you know, conflict between the two of them. But in the book, when Paul drinks the water of life, Jessica doesn't know what's wrong with him. In the movie, Jessica gives him the idea to drink the water of life. She says, you have to do it. It's the next step for you to become the Kwisatz Tadarach, whereas Paul knows it's what he has to do just in instinctively in the in the books. And something they never really put in the movies, but it works better because it creates stakes, is that Paul in the novel is an unmatched warrior and nobody can defeat him in combat. But it wouldn't quite work with the movie, especially when he's facing Fade, especially when he's facing Jamis at the end of the first film. There wouldn't be stakes if the audience knows, oh, he's just going to best him easily. So... Not making Paul the greatest warrior, but still showing that he's a great warrior. He's he, people multiple times say he's a great warrior, but not like the unbeatable, unmatched warrior that he's in the novel. Yeah, he's he's the greatest warrior in the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, Duncan Idaho trained him. Duncan Idaho said that. Duncan Idaho says that Paul is better than than him, and Bunk, Duncan Idaho's you know the greatest fighter in the universe. As famous, well. he's yeah. famous around the universe. But Paul is yeah. the greatest warrior in the universe. He's unbeatable, and that's a major change. But it's better for storytelling, I think. And also with Paul, yeah, that, that was another thing on Paul for different than book to movie. But well, we talked about that a little bit earlier in our main episode of the podcast. And then I, the Fremen culture, the North versus South, those who believe in a prophet, those who don't, that's a major difference, I would say. In the books, not everyone believes in Paul, but it's not as stark of a contrast of kind of 50-50 in the Fremen culture, whether you believe or not, is is more in the books a lot of people don't believe he's the prophet and try to challenge him. And Paul has had to face many duels and had to kill many people in the Fremen culture. Also, Chani fights many of his battles as well in the mm -hmm. books. And so not everyone believes in Paul and people challenge him, but most accept him as the prophet, as the Lisa al Gaib. Yeah. But again, this worked. It creates conflict for the story, which is important. And these are some of the main differences between Dune Part 2, the movie, and the book Dune. Let's get into some more stuff from the movie, though. Now, Hans Zimmer, obviously, as we all know, won an Oscar for his score for Dune. And in a lot of ways, he, not I wouldn't say improved, but created new sounds and new music for this film. And he focused his energies on uh, a couple of things. So in this film, I think that he really doubled down on the percussion and created new styles of percussion, building off of what he did with that astounding percussion in Dune. He also really focused on uh, the duduk instrument, that woodwind instrument uh, from the Middle East, and using it really as the key theme maker of the love between Paul and Shawnee. And there's a couple of great tracks, but I think that this score was very soulful and captured the essence of, of passion and love that wasn't really too much in the first score because there wasn't really a love story. But I think that he really helped the audience feel what Paul and Chani were feeling in that first act of the film. And then the incredible action sequences. I think that in some ways this score could even work better than the first score for the film. 
uh, than the first film did. And I was absolutely blown away from the sounds he created again on this one. And I love the relationship between Chani and Paul as they're sort of courting each other and they're both, you know, the flirtatious thing. And it was huge for the audience to see Zendaya and Timothy Chalamet kiss. There was like an eruption. People were like, oh my God, they're kissing. Because <laughs> they're both, both such huge stars and they're great friends. And obviously everyone's into the the, the superstar culture and Hollywood culture, Tom Holland, Zendaya, Timothy Chalamet, Kelly Jenner and everything. So it was really it was really interesting to see the audience response to such huge stars kissing finally on screen. It was pretty interesting. Seemed to be that's all some of the people in the audience cared about. <laughs> <laughs> Not our audience. I really loved the differences in, in the interactions between Robin and Fade as well because they're brothers, but Fade is obviously – the chosen one in a ways for the Harkonnen family. Beast Raban is more of just a brute. He's, you know, he's got a massive temper. He's not as intelligent as Faith, but Faith is a much more skilled fighter and the more dominant brother. And Beast Raban, he's given governorship over Arrakis by his uncle Baron, but he's failing because a major plot point of this film are the Fremen in their guerrilla war tactics of trying to stop the Harkonnens from harvesting the spice as well as just taking out Harkonnens as much as they can. And we have great sequences of this guerrilla warfare in the desert of the Fremen with Paul as a Fadaikin, with Chani and the warriors, the Fadaikins of the Fremen, taking out their harvesters, their ships, and Robin failing and, and attacks happening at Arakeen, the main city in the capital of Arrakis, where Robin is in control of the planet now, or he thinks he's in control of the planet. And he basically gets demoted by Baron by to get Fade as the governor of Iraq as sort of his present, because after the big de- battle we were talking about in the arena between Fade and the prisoners, Fade's upset. He's like, I should drown you, uncle. Like, because he can't believe that his uncle tried to kill him in the ring. But he's like, I get, I did you a favor. You're a hero now. You just, def- you bested somebody that was not drugged up. And you did it without a shield. You are worshipped more than ever on Getty Prime, Fade. I, I did you a favor. And, you know, Fade wants to kill his uncle. But then M- uncle, his uncle Baron reveals that you're going to be governor of Arrakis. You're going to get control of Arrakis. That's going to be your present. That's your birthday present, Fade, basically. And after that, make Fade Emperor at some point. So then they're on the same page and he doesn't want to kill him anymore. And also, Fade is very much the counterpoint to Paul and has also been bred in this line by the Bene Gesserit who are trying to uh, fulfill the prophecy of creating the Chosen One. So Fade is, in a way, a polar opposite, the opposite side of the same coin as Paul. And he can have the same destiny as Paul. He very much could could and so i love that aspect and i it, i think it really showcases paul and fade as being these perfect rivals for one another and also seeing that setting up for future fade is going his line is going to continue with lady margot well it he, doesn't the lawyer yeah he did con- he conceived a child with lady margot so the the Rotha line will continue the harkonnen fight Har- fade yeah. Rotha line will continue well technically the harkonnen line continues yeah, through yeah yeah, yeah. The Atreides, the same way, and and so that was just a great counter. I loved love to be uh, Robin and Fade together, especially like in that war room. I like the war room a lot because yeah. we didn't really get that in the books to see sort of what their logistics setup looks like. The tech, yeah, it was really interesting to see their their view of the planet and how they only see really half of it because they don't think anything lives in the south because there's just a giant sandstorm always there and a windstorm <laughs> always and. The way that Fade treated Raban, he bested him in seconds and made him kiss his boot. I kiss freaking love that dude. scene. But Austin Butler's Fade was just terrific. His voice was awesome. And, and the character design with the dark teeth, the black teeth, especially in the infrared sequence in the battle arena, it looked awesome. It yeah. looked so incredible. Yeah, when he smiled, it was like, it was just blackness inside of his mouth. And there's something really significant with Charlotte Rampling's Reverend Mother. And she says this great line at the end of the film when Paul is threatening everybody. And she called Paul an abomination when he used the voice on her. Remember? Mm-hmm. And it's ironic because she didn't call, she doesn't call someone like Fade Rotha an abomination, even though he is a sociopathic killer. A, he's a monster, and Paul's not. But the reason why she looks at Paul as an abomination, I think, is because they can't control Paul. So Because the Bene Gesserit... Through Lady Margot, they learned how Fade can be controlled. And as long as he can be controlled, that's good for them. They can use him 
as emperor. And so they can't control Paul, they learn. And I think that's why that Reverend Mother is like, you're an abomination. Well, that's a, that's a way to interpret it. But really, according to the books, Ali is the abomination. Yeah. Ali is the, the abomination because she's she was a fetus and a baby in the womb that got consciousness as well as became a Reverend Mother at the same time with unlimited power. So the abomination is a term used for Alia. Jessica created an abomination. I think I like how they got the line in and how they had uh, Reverend Mother Mahim say it because she does say it to Alia in the book, to Alia's face. She calls her an abomination immediately because she knows what she is. But I, I like how they got in. But yeah, it's interesting that she she called Paul abomination. I think they wanted to get in there for the lovers fans, of the books yeah. and the fans of the books. To call Paul it was a little interesting because technically Paul isn't an abomination because he is the Kwisox Haderach, which they created. But it's interesting. It's a good point that since they can't control him. Yeah. The um, way they view him is like that. that's how completely con- misconstrued their notions of morality are. Yeah. Where they look at him as the problem, even though... And they they would have been happy with Fade Rotha being in his place, yeah, exactly. even though Fade, even though Fade is a monster. Yeah. So technically, Ali is an abomination, not Paul. Mm-hmm. She's the abomination. Yeah. Yeah. It's like cool, when, when in the book when Reverend Mother she sees Alia for the first time, she's like, "Kill that child right now! Kill it!" <laughs> <laughs> she's an abomination. And in the Lynch film, after she kills Baron, she's like celebrating. She's like, "Ah, <laughs> it's fucking wild. It's crazy, man." <laughs> So there's a question you asked me about Jamis before yes. we started filming. So for anyone who hasn't read the books, Jamis has very small amount of screen time in both films. Obviously, he has that fight, the knife fight with Paul at the end of Dune. But we saw, like, Paul saw a vision of Jamis before he fought Jamis, which confused him. And then when we they get, were in the ornithopter in, in the storm. The, yeah, in, a th- in, in the ornithopter where he learned how to... And then that's how he learned to let go of the controls and let the storm take them for safety out of the storm. And then there's another sequence in another vision in Dune Part 2 where Jamis uh, has a couple of moments with Paul. Can you explain for anyone who's like not quite sure what this relationship is, how significant is, the, is Jamis to Paul in the real storyline of the books? So... The thing with Jamis is, is Jamis is a storytelling device in the movies to show Paul's visions in a way because they actually don't explore his visions very much in the book in the movies because it's sort of hard to do. Yeah, you know how do you show it's confusing someone who has prescient visions of different realities, different futures, different pasts, different presents, in not in order. In and some, in a book, you can explain it in depth. Yeah, so I think it's really done really well and subtly with Jamis, where even though Paul had never met Jamis before, he's seeing him kills Jamis, and now he's seeing Jamis in this movie. Jamis is a representation of futures and pasts where he didn't kill Jamis, and Jamis became his friend, and Jamis taught him the ways of the Fremen, taught him the ways of the desert. So that's basically what Jamis is, because like I said, the Bane Gesserit lay the groundwork and foundation of a potential Kwisak Hierarch to show up on a planet like Arrakis with their religion. And that's why Paul understands the Fremen, the Fremen tongue. He can speak Fremen really quickly, he knows their ways. One of the signs is he will know our ways as, as, if he's one of us. And that's because he's spending more time with the spice. Yes. Breathing more, it in. And he's getting those visions. And those are just, even if even though they're not clear to him and they're not really in an order, they're becoming a part of his consciousness. So J- Jamis, is a re- Jamis is a representation of futures where he didn't kill Jamis and they became friends. And that's how he learns the Fremen way so quickly. In the movie, they show... Chani shows him like how to do the desert yeah, walk and everything but it was, like that. Jamis taught him so much in the other timelines. Yeah, it, yeah. basically you can assume that yeah. you know Jamis and him became great friends, and that's why in the in the Dune Part One they, he's smiling at Paul as he's talking to him like over his shoulder or something like that. Yeah, and because it wasn't that timeline, exactly. So that's how Paul is able to understand the Fremen ways so quickly. And you could kind of it's kind of similar to Amy Adams' character in Arrival, where yeah, yeah. as she's learning the language, she's beginning to understand. She's looking at time as a circle. Now, what's happening with Paul is the more time he spends breathing in and, and eating spice, his abilities of not just foresight, but seeing other lives, other versions of these courses of events are all coming, all encompassing. And Timothy Chalamet was so terrific in this movie because he plays two characters in this movie, man. He plays Paul Atreides, and then he plays the Kwisatz Haderach. 
And after he drinks the water of life, he is a different person. And it's in the eyes, the facial expressions. Timmy did a great job. Basically, now he's a different being. And I remember reading an interview last year where when they were making Dune Part 1, Denis had, Vill Villeneuve had to try to stop Timoth Timothy Chip from trying to become Muad'Di, basically, to try to do that persona. He's like, you need to just be Paul Atreides right now. You need to be like a naive child, even though you're super skilled and, and highly intelligent. And in the books, he's obviously a mentat as well. But then to finally see him transform in such a great nonverbal performance and become the Kwisatz Haderach, where now, now he sees everything at, all at once, every possible future, clearly, whatever path he takes, he can see, obviously there are blind spots, but now he sees many different per versions of avenues. Think of Doctor Strange and Avengers, Endgame, Infinity War, seeing the one path where they'll succeed. He's that narrow path where the Atreides and the Fremen can defeat the Harkonnens and the Emperor, and that's the path they take. Where before he has the water of life, he doesn't want power, he doesn't want control, he wants to be a Fremen. And Chani sees there's naivety in that, where, yes, that's what you want, but in order for the Fremen to become free, you have you will have to maintain become become control, get control of the Fremen, get control of the armies. And when you defeat the Harkonnens and, and, and the Emperor, who's going to be in power? You're going to be in power. So even though that's what you want, she sees it also that it's inevitable, inevitable that if you follow that path, you will gain power. And Paul's afraid of that path because he knows that gaining power will lead him, lead him to leading a religious war and killing billions of people throughout the entire universe. And in a way, it's an inevitability. Yeah. yeah. To change things, it will happen. It's the only way to, to change things. And I got, I, I've seen a recent posts we've made online. I, I made a post about something. I, I called Paul naive and unsure of himself in the first film. Yeah, he is. And he is. It, it, that's also slightly different from the books. I think he's a little more, he's not quite, doesn't have those qualities to as strong, as much of an extent as Timothy's version of him did. But for the storytelling of the movies, it works to make him really feel like a kid, to make him feel not as not as primed for leadership. He's not a mentat in the movies and he's a warrior, but we don't he he's not perceived as the greatest warrior alive in the movies. And and in the first film and for much of the first act of this film, he has that naivety, he has an innocence about him and he has a desire to do what's moral and what's right and to really just be one amongst the people. Whereas it works better than the in the book, Paul, because we can see the contrast. It's kind of like the uh, Michael Corleone transformation, yeah, where he's he doesn't want to be involved in this. He wants to just be himself, but then a series of events leads him to the make the choice of this is the only way forward. I have to become this different per version of myself to protect the ones I love and to make a great change. And so, in a way, it is reminiscent of the Corleone character arc in one and two. And to stay on him and Chani, I'm so curious how they're going to get back together because it's done differently. And obviously they will get back together and she will be by his side because the visions in Dune Part 1, they show them on that ship together and they're looking out at the soldiers yes. uh, just cheering for Paul. On, on Caladan. Yeah. It, it's not Caladan, it's anywhere. Okay, yeah. It could be, who knows what planet it is, you know. Um, obviously the religious war, Chani's by his side. And he says... You know, I've I've seen like Chani will come around. I've seen it. So at some point in part three, she will come around. Maybe it'll, they'll open up with them together. But they will be together at some point because obviously it's in Doom Part One, one of his visions. And Paul says it because now he is the Quizaj Tadarak. He sees everything. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's the Lisan Al Gaib. That's the difference. There's a major difference between those two beings. The Quizaj Tadarak is what the Benjes are created. The Lisan Al Gaib is the Messiah and the prophet of the Fremen who would turn their planet into a paradise mm -hmm. and save them. And then we got a hint of that paradise with the ocean of water. Yep. Yeah, with, vision. Uh, with Alia. Yeah, it was is a combination. It could be that, or it could also be like a, a juxtaposition of his world of Caladon with mm -hmm. Arrakis. Yeah, that's a great point too. And there's a really interesting moment when Stilgar asks him, what do you see for us? And then Paul says, I see green pastures and water and that's a moment where i wonder is paul lying to stilgar in that moment 
It's good. Uh, Javier Bardem's obviously yeah. a legend. He's such an incredible actor. And he's terrific as Stilgar. And I like his performance here because he's obviously full of nuggets of wisdom, but then at times, once he's very comfortable with Paul, and you see that he's a devout follower of the religions of the Fremen and the beliefs and the Prophet, the, the Mahdi, the Lisa and Al-Gaib, he begins to worship Paul, which is similar to Stilgar in the books. He starts to believe really quickly that he's the Lisa and Al-Gaib, as shown in the books. And in the movie, he says to the other elders that I will fight and die for, for, the, for uh, Lisa Al-Gaib. Now, I wouldn't describe Stilgar completely as a fanatic in the books like he sort of is in the movies, but I think that the writers wanted to show a stark difference in a fanaticism versus a Fremen, like a religious fanatic versus sort of a normal Fremen who's just trying to survive and be a part of the community, where they, they live cohesively and together, obviously, but yeah. to split them in, down the middle is really interesting. And it's... And it, it splits Chani and Stilgar up. Yeah. And it's, it's important because it creates conflict. Yeah. And it's good for storytelling. And shows that Paul can manipulate the people who are most devoted to him. Yes. So in the books, a lot of Paul's inner monologues, when he's talking to Stilgar, he sees he starts as a friend, but now he's a follower. Yeah. It's it's said in the movie, I believe. He says he it says, to yeah, Gurney. He, he says it to Gurney when they're walking through a cliffside. They 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 used to be they were friends, but now they're followers. Yeah. So yeah. in the in his inner monologues in the in the book, multiple times he's talking to Stilgar. He sees. Uh, he was once a mentor to me. He was he's a friend, but now he just he's a follower of mine. He's a, he's a believer of mine, mm -hmm. and which is you know great as a general. But in terms of what Paul had originally, it's with dangerous him, to his power. Exactly, yeah. he's lost in a lot of ways. Paul has lost that friend because now he's just gained a believer out of Stilgar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think point. that was a good. I thought it was a good decision to show fanaticism in Stilgar. I agree, and you also showed. It it all I mean they were definitely the northern and southerner differences, but it was also as if all of the fanatics were older Fremen, and most of the non-believers were younger Fremen. You know what I mean? It was like youth versus um, age, in a way. And so I think that Denis Villeneuve did that on purpose of showing like the very devoted followers in the in the first half of the film were generally the older Fremen, and the younger Fremen were like the Fuck that. We're not doing that. We went to college, yeah, we man. Went to college, our professors bro. opened our eyes. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so I think that they did that on purpose. The, there was definitely there was the the and there's the joke Chani says, can't you tell the the accent's different? Yeah. But also the age was a difference as well. Yeah. And you know, I, I love Stilgar as a character in the book, and I think Javier portrays him so well in this movie because he has great wisdom, he has great knowledge. He's a he's a leader of Fremen, of 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 Siege Tabar. And it's great when, you know, he's such a developed follower, he asks Paul to kill him to gain control of their siege, to have a voice. Multiple times in the in the books it happens as well. You know, everyone's waiting for Paul. The Fremen are all waiting for Paul to challenge Stilgar. That's the, that's the way their culture works. The strongest has to be the leader. The strongest fighter has to be the leader. That's usually how it works. The leaders of the Fremen are the best warriors. It's not just being the best mind. And... Paul doesn't want to kill Stilgar, and he says that great lines from the book as well. Would I chip my blade before going into battle? Like, why would I cut off my own arm in a fight? Stilgar is a great person. He's a great warrior. He's a great leader. Why would it's I cool kill, dude? Why would I kill him? So he, Paul's also changing some of the ways of the Fremen that make more sense to him because he's blending the Fremen culture with his own culture and in terms of war. In fighting, it is best to have your best weapons versus just the strongest one prevailing. There's also another great reveal in the film, which informs us about the massacre in the first film. And so audiences believe that, you know, it was the Emperor's plan to kill off the Atreides line. So, and then that was the whole motivation between... between uh, excavate, uh, bringing out the Harkonnens from Arrakis and, and putting in their Atreides to replace them, which led to the trap of the Harkonnens and Sardukar, Sardukar attacking the Atreides and killing everybody there in Arrakis. That was part of that line, so they thought. And then we learn in this film, it was actually all a Bene Gesserit plot. Reverend Mother Mo Mohim, played by Charlotte Rampling, she tells Princess Erlon that it was her who was whispering the Emperor's ear and motivating him and convincing him to kill the Atreides because 
Bene Gesserit felt that the Atreides line could no longer be trusted with the endeavor of bringing about the Chosen One. They were becoming too rebellious and too dangerous to the Bene Gesserit. And so that was the real motivation between behind killing off the Atreides line. Yes. And I want to go back to the Fremen stuff in Stilgar for a, for a sec. Keep going on Stilgar, bro. There are two things that I was so excited to see in this in this movie from the books. So the death still where he takes Jessica to this massive pool yeah. of water. But not only is it, it's a very special water because it's water reclaimed from the dead. This is water of dead bodies, of the corpses of Fremen for and it's generations. it's never drunk, right? Never drunk. Yeah. It'll be used to transform Arrakis into having trees and rivers again. When the Lisa al Gaib comes, you know, this water will transform Arrakis. And I love how Jessica says so many souls. She gives tears. She gives water to the dead. But this whole basin, this whole massive, massive pool of water is reclaimed water from dead bodies. And part of the Fremen culture is they reclaim water from dead bodies. And when it's done to, when it's done to a Fremen, it's a very, it's, it's an honor. You know, you're giving your water back to the tribe. To the it community. reminded me of mummification. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. And they take much a lot of care when they do it to their own kind versus a uh, killed warrior. But I was so curious what it was going to be like in a movie reclaiming water from bodies. And it was really cool. It was just this little me me mechanism with these tubes. And they just s stab somebody with this syringe kind of thing. And then the water started pumping from their bodies. Yeah, there's like the those water. leather pumps yeah. that you see from like coal. You know what I mean? Yeah. The coal presses. It was so interesting. Yeah. It's easy. It works. It might not be exactly how Herbert was describing it or picturing it in his head. But how else would you do it, you know, really quickly and effectively? But I love those scenes of using the, the water reclaimers on bodies as well as seeing the death still. And they even did it to, so, to Harkins that were still alive. But then when it happens to their own, like Jamis's body, is still in that is in that sacred wrapping, and then they have a, more of a ceremony for him when they reclaim his water. And so it's it's a it's a thing that I've always been curious about seeing visually done really well, especially in Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Yeah, I loved it. It was really interesting, and it, it just uh, something that really struck me about this film because we finally got to see the Fremen culture was the the immense amount of detail and creativity that was put into the production of it. Whether it be the, the wardrobe, the design of the structures, the interiors, and the cultural aspects, like this basic, in a way, the dehydration of a dead body that they respect, the ritualistic aspects to it, and then also the, the intricacies of the design of their tools, of their instruments, uh, their what their furniture looks like. I really loved this film because we only got very small hints of Fremen culture in the first film. And I think that they did that on purpose because they wanted to save that because we got so much of, you know, the Latos, Arrakis, the Harkonnen stuff. So I think they were purposely saving the Fremen culture to really showcase it in a stunning way with this film. And I was really blown away. I, I was feeling aspects of like ancient Egypt, obviously, like that whole Jamis ritual made me feel like, oh, this is like a mummification of a respected warrior. And then the interiors, the sand, obviously, the desert. Just so many aspects made me think of uh, uh, hieroglyphics on the walls, Egyptian culture. And Middle Eastern and Middle Eastern culture, Eastern culture obviously. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of Leto, there's a great nod to the book where Paul sees a vision of a shrine of his father in the desert with his father's skull. This is accurate to the books where there is a skull-shaped shrine of Leto that Fremen... Fremen people make pilgrimages to and worship as a shrine to obviously the father of the oh, body of yeah. Lisa and Al Gaib. Mm -hmm. So that that was a really cool nod to the books as well. Yeah. So many little things and nuggets from the movie from the book. But I've only seen this twice, so obviously we're we're probably leaving so much out off the top of my head. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, of quick it's things still fresh in our minds. It's still fresh, but also I need to watch it a so few fresh. more times. Man, it was such a great experience. And again, going back to the red and the warmth, you know, there are so many incredible shots of the sun and the moon and. And an eclipse, and just like a moon cutting out just a a bit of the sun to create like a crescent sun. So the 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 idea of red, uh, dawn of a new age, the the sun setting is the 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 ending of an old era, and so this beautiful use of the warm lighting pouring in from the sides, from the windows, from the openings, I really do think that Vinny. Denis Villeneuve and Greg Fraser were highly motivated by those ideas 
of rebirth and renewal um, showcased with the lighting of the film. And also so many great looks at the actual sun and moons in the sky. Yeah, one of my favorite shots is the the double moon, like you said, creating like that double crescent yeah. sun. Really beautiful, really yeah. incredible stuff. Like it's gorgeous. And, and With, IMAX, there's red, and then the, yeah. the sky was gray. Yeah, in IMAX, it was astounding, astounding. This whole movie was astounding. Another great, interesting thing to finally see in, in the movie was the baby makers, not ba- not like the the baby shahaluds, yeah. the baby worms, <laughs> which is where obviously, like we talked about earlier, they create the water of life by drowning a worm in water. Water to a sandworm is poison, and that's why it dies so quickly. And they drown them in it, and that's how they extract the water of life. And, you know, baby sandworms will come into play in the Dune lore, if you've ever seen it, if they make more of the books and the movies. It's pretty crazy what happens later on. But it's it's an interesting thing to see, and they, I think they did a really great job, just this kind of this little temple where this one woman is kind of in, in charge of the makers and the baby worms. And there's also... And also, there's going to be quite a few memes and gifts. <laughs> yes, there's going to be quite a few memes. It's going to be a meme movie of the baby uh, baby worms. I thought that if they did Alia live, like filmed her as a kid, I thought that was going to be like the the meme of the year, like yeah. Alia stuff. But since she they just kept her as an infant in the womb, then that's not obviously going to be memed. Um, I just want to talk about the huge, the great battle at the end, and I noticed a. a reference to the first film so in the first film paul has that vision of himself on the battlefield he like jumps over a guy kills a couple of enemy soldiers and then reveals his face through his face guard to the audience they you'd been love duplicated that shot but it was chani this time yeah from behind Did you notice that yeah. yeah it was the exact same shot she came to frame looked into the audience with like her forearm below her chin exactly exact exact same shot that was a great one Yeah. That was a one take. It was awesome. There was a great one to open the film when they were sitting on the hillside. Yeah, I was just going back and forth, yeah. the panning back and forth, up yeah. and down, tilting Excellent. up and down. Excellent one it, it was terrific. Excellent one This movie had so many. It's a lot of, not long one but there's several shots that are like 10, 15 seconds of a lot of complicated stuff going on. And we got our Oppenheimer moment with the uh, <laughs> atomic arsenal. Oh my God, it was so cool. That explosion <laughs> was epic, man. Yeah. Absolutely epic. The atomics, the family atomics of the Atreides. So all the great houses have atomics, but however, it's illegal to use atomics on other great houses, even though they all have arsenals. But that's one of the main rules of the empire is you can't use them. And Paul used them because he's like, I, I do what I want. <laughs> Gurney was so excited. <laughs> yeah. I love the revelation of Paul to Baron because Baron doesn't know he's alive. And Emperor is even questioning, like, what do you know about this, this Muad'Dib? Who, what do you know about Muad'Dib? And they're all trying, like, we have to stop this Muad'Dib. They don't know it's Paul. And, to, and then Paul even says, um, hello, grandfather. He still has the He was, the, He's the like a villain. Face. Yeah, you can yeah. see his eyes. It's epic. Then you see the rev- the realization in, um, in Baron's eyes right before he dies. And then he just slowly stabs that knife in his neck, the Chris knife. I thought it was so smart to keep his, his face covered in that in that scene. Because it it, t- it stripped him of his humanity a little bit, and showcased him as like kind of like this this mysterious villainous figure that these other people have been viewing him as, hearing the stories and building up this villain. And so uh, I think that covering his face made that scene really work. It was also great to see Gurney Halleck get revenge on the Harkonnens yeah. when he kills Beast Raban. So they obviously know each other in the movie. They do the line like, "Look who's back from the dead." Now, Gurney Halleck's backstory is he grew up in and was imprisoned and enslaved by the Harkonnens, and that's how they got he got that scar and they killed his family. So he's been dying for revenge on the Harkonnens, and he also gets into an argument with Paul in the book at the end of the film where he asks Paul, like, you promised me I'd get revenge against the Harkonnens because he wanted to fight Fade Rotha instead of Paul fighting Fade Rotha. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas in the movie, he's, like, doing it as a way of protecting Paul. Yeah. Basically, yeah, like let me fight this battle for you. Yeah, but he, that was him getting his vengeance against the Harkins, killing Beast Robin, mm-hmm. which is cool. And yeah. Dave Batista had a ton more screen time, which I predicted, bro. You were right. I called that shit. You were right. You gotta have him. Gotta have him. He's excellent. Yeah. But yeah, this movie was so goddamn. It's, it was amazing. It was exactly what I wanted it to be. It's a five out of five. And in terms of science fiction, Science fiction gives the, a filmmaker, when they can work with a budget, the ability, if they're a great visionary, to cr- show us something exciting and new and never seen before. And so often in the science fiction genre, 
Um, we get kind of like a lot of the same. But when you have someone like Denis Villeneuve, he's going to show you something spectacular. And we, whether it be the beautiful cinematography of the deserts and then using the beautiful production design and cultural instances and then infrared, black and white cinematography for Getty Prime, there's so many colors and, and ideas and visual motifs and themes that are perfectly interlaced amongst one another that it's really a visual feast for the senses. And it's honestly not that high of a budget of a film. But when you give someone like Denis that money, you're going to get something really special that nobody else can provide. Yeah, and we're filming this episode before its release. And right now it's projected for $65 million domestic opening gross. I'm guessing it'll hit 80 for opening domestic. Weekend. Yeah, I see it making like 150 worldwide possibly. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a huge hit. I think a lot of people are going to go to the theater two three times to see this movie. I know I will. And I can't wait to already see it again in IMAX for sure. And it was just, you know, it, it's unlike any other movie I've ever seen before. And it's special. And I can't wait. I'm sure they're going to make Dune Messiah. I'm sure they'll make Dune Part 3. And the continuation of the story and the continuation of Paul and Chani and their story. And I wish I could talk about, like, what I want to see and what, what happens <laughs> next because it's so good. And I, I'm just ecstatic. And if they stay true to, like, another time, if they do another time jump, unlike they did just a small time jump in this film, there, yeah. there has to be a time jump going into the Dune 3. But I'm so curious what's going to happen between Paul and Chani. And I think that's good for leaving a cliffhanger. This movie ended basically on a cliffhanger. It's a good cliffhanger. Because the know. first film didn't really end on a cliffhanger at all. Eh, not really. It was just no. like a, a midpoint. Yeah, but the yeah. book the book itself doesn't... It's kind of a cliffhanger. But really the cliffhanger here is Chani and Paul being separated. And Paul not... His ascendancy to the throne not being accepted. And beginning the Holy War. The Holy War has begun. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's the big cliffhanger. Yeah, he sends the ships up. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he's going to take out those great houses. <laughs> but now he has the greatest fighting force... In the universe. Sardaukar. No, the Fremen. The Fremen and the Sardaukar. No, he doesn't have... No, they killed the Sardaukar. All of them? The yeah, Sardaukar are the Emperor's army. They would not fight for Paul Atreides. They killed them all. Even as Emperor? No. Yeah. The Sardaukar are Emperor... Yeah, yeah so they're not his. Great point. They yeah. killed them all. Great killed point. all the... All the Sardaukar are dead. They're done. On that... Pl on Arrakis. Dead. Poor Sardaukar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but no, the Fremen are the greatest fighting force in the universe. Yeah. That's what Leto realized, you know, in the first film, Desert Power. Desert Power. Yeah. They got worms, bro. They got the worms. Man, <laughs> what a great show. I also love the wardrobe. Like, Beast, I mean, uh, Fade Routh's wardrobe. Like, His armor was great. So, it's, he's got the cape and everything. Yeah. Like, when, when he had in, the when cape. He's in the siege. Oh, my God. It was so cool. Walking in like a badass Darth Vader, man. It looked cool. Holy shit. So great. It looked cool. All right. I love Dune Part 2 so, so much. Can't wait to see it for a third time. Thank you to everyone who came out to our screening and won tickets to that. It was such a blast. Can't recommend seeing this in IMAX if you haven't yet. I'm sure you've already seen it if you made it this far into this episode, <laughs> two hours in. But, you know, I can't wait to talk about this more in future episodes and to see it again. It was just an incredible experience. And finally to see it, and they better announce Dune Messiah ASAP. James will still be talking about Dune in every episode. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, yeah, I'll don't still worry. mention I'm still it. I'm bring it up. I mean, I, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? All right. See you all next time. Thanks for tuning in. This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly, Mark Nikaj. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.